the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. Well, this is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I am geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys a weekly Mauna Loa update today, Friday, May 14th, 2021. It's been a quiet week on Mauna Loa, it's been the third quiet week in a row, and there really hasn't been a whole lot of earthquakes, um, a few, not a whole lot. Uh, there hasn't been really any change in a GPS extension um, across the caldera with a one uh, line line that we have publicly available, um, but we do have uh, some new research that was released this week that we're going to cover is the past eighteen years of the volcano that we're going to cover in a little more detail today. To kind of kind of that's where we are now at this point. The volcano has been pretty quiet. We're talking about things that aren't happening so much right now, but leading up to now, so we can discuss the signals we're seeing now in, in a little more context or so. So before we get through all that, I just want to make sure that we thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, whether or you're getting to us on YouTube or Facebook or uh, Twitter or Hawaii Tracker. Uh, Dane's going to be collecting all those platforms, all the chats, and manning our streams. We will do a round of questions and, and discussion of our viewer questions here at the end of our presentation today. But starting you guys off with this view of the Upper Southwest Rift Zone here today. And this is an area that is actually interesting, um, not quite down this far, but this is a slightly different view to show you guys something different every week. Um, it's up uphill from here is the area of, we believe, um, expansion of the dike under Mauna Loa that occurred in the 2015, 2014, 2015 era. 
And that's something we're going to deal with in, in more detail here when we turn to that new research put out by University of Miami just earlier this week. So, but to start off with our with our uh, weekly update from the USGS here, there is really not a whole lot of change, no significant change. 130 small magnitude earthquakes, mostly in their summit, summit upper elevation flanks, all less than five miles below ground level. That's all the same as it's been. Low rates of deformation, and really, really is not anything of substance that's that's new in there. I mean, I wouldn't say it's substance. It's it's important stuff, but it, there's no, no 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 real change there. Nothing novel. Nothing is really um, new information for us to consider there. So we'll turn back to our our GPS line here that's showing the distance between this northern MLKP and this southern MLSP station across Mauna Loa Summit Caldera. And as as that Summit Caldera spreads apart, this line goes up, and as it contracts, it goes down. And so you see that was the pattern that happened here uh, over the first part of the year, beginning in mid-January. So we've had a expansion of that summit caldera before a rapid contraction here and really in the last three weeks it's been pretty averagely not you know it's on, on average not really going up or down it did seem like it went up a little bit then down a little bit and it's hard to tell here with the noise here at the end but if we were to average the whole thing out it's fairly flat com compared to anything else before and of course that follows on the previous um, october to november 2020 contraction as well back in there so this is the first two contractions of the volcano that we've really seen of this magnitude we've had smaller ones here's one back earlier in 2020 but we scroll down here to the five-year plot on the bottom and here's the most recent one that we're in right now here's the one that was at the tail end of last year and there's always been a couple little blips that you get over time but nothing of the magnitude that we're seeing here recently in the last few months that's that's our interesting signal that we're trying to decipher and we're not going to know for sure until something actually happens in the volcano. But we're trying to frame it and give you guys some context of some of the research that's been put out before and circle measurements. And so uh, um, let's just look quickly at the tilt. The tilt for the last month. We'll look at the blue line here is the one that's oriented towards the, the magma reservoir. And it's showing some very minor wiggles. The scale is really not that big, right? But we learned um, from the previous uh, event last month that a two microradian magnitude offset from Mauna Loa uh, may be significant because most of the activity is deeper under under the volcano and deeper beneath the, beneath the tilt meter and out of range so you don't get as big of a measurements as you do on Kilauea for example but it also suggests that that change is happening shallow enough that the tilt, tilt meter actually can, is detecting it um, which is also kind of a new thing right it's not something that's been seen really before um, unless it's been in a lead up ramp up to an eruption and lava's coming out of the ground shortly afterwards. So interesting to see these these may just be small little variations. You see there's quite a lot of noise from the you know, so we're basically within that range of the noise at this point in time. But still interesting to consider with that with that average slight wiggle, you know, there might be some movement in that shallower part of that system when the magma's accumulating there. That's uh, all the, the deformation we have to go on if we look at the earthquakes. Near map of the earthquakes and island, we can see that there has really been not a whole lot in Mauna Loa. A couple up here southwest of the caldera, one on the northwest flank, a few here in this Kauiki sector um, of the east flank between Mauna Loa and Kilauea. And Kilauea has got a few going on, and the Pahala hotspot uh, source zone is also still active as it's been um, for, for years now. So really, the area we're concerned with, Mauna Loa here, is very quiet, in fact, right? And so normally we look at the USGS plots of just the summit. So let's look at that. This is the last week here, and a few shallow earthquakes up here, and these are the ones beneath this upper southwest rift zone. This is an area that's interesting to us here, um, leading up as well to looking at the past 18 years, and in particular the past eight years, past six, seven, eight years or so, um, because this is the area that that has shown some of the dike expansion recently but still we've seen earthquakes here recently and we've seen earthquakes up here recently and all from presumed uh, presumed expansion of the magma reservoir as magma is still feeding into the volcano right and the question we have to kind of frame it all is not not just is the volcano changing and sh showing an evolution of signals and magmatic process but rather is magma going to reach the surface and erupt where we have to be concerned with it as residents of the island 
um, and as humans here on the surface. So all that other stuff's interesting, of course, and that's what we're going to get to today is all this is happening without an eruption as a bottom line. It's a long, long-term pattern. Lots of changes in the last 18 years, but no eruption in that entire time. Um, finishing off the earthquakes here, you can see that the earthquake pattern of highs uh, over the last year here in the past few months, um, kind of one flurry that, that um, decays and another flurry that decays here. So earthquakes by week here is our, our measure on the left, and you can see that we've we had been up at 250 and 200 earthquakes per week and tailed off back down to less than 100 and now we're less than 50 earthquakes per week, more or less where we sit today. Right, so actually quite slow. Um, looking at the whole last month, you can see the location of those previous earthquake flurries over here northwest of that summit caldera and to some extent here in the southwest rift zone area as well, upper southwest rift zone. Although. Uh, really, you got to go back further in a month to see this pattern in full for the last year or so. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll go with here, here, last thing. But before we do that, looking at the past month earthquakes per day now on the left, you can see there's the last two little um, flurries and decays. And really, it's been down to we're less than 10 earthquakes per day now in that summit region, which is really quite low. So um, that in itself is uh, no cause for uh, alarm. Um, Although we are watching for any change in that pattern, um, which is a possibility at any, at any point in time. Okay, so that's the, the past month. Let me click here on the last year and have it load you guys the map here. So here's a whole past year. So you see the area above that main caldera and above the upper southwest rift zone and northwest of the caldera are the ones that are showing those earthquake flurry zones right that's that's mostly it within a summit area we've mentioned before of course the the, the kawiki and the hilea and the kona uh, zones farther away from the summit of the volcano that are, are the flanks that move as well so um it's that northwest of the caldera sector that was we discussed last week following on usgs hvo's volcano watch and this is all H USGS HVO data I'm showing you guys here, all their live monitoring data from their website. And mahalo to them to make all this information available. And we're going to combine it here moving forward with this new research that came out in Nature uh, this week. But leading up to kind of to, to recap how we, how we discussed this last week and to set the, the stage for this week, because uh, last week we were discussing essentially um, the, the, the pattern um, um, as it related to 1984 eruption and a 2015 intrusion and so today we're going to bring that forward all the way to 2020 and kind of try to tie it together with what we're seeing here in early 2021 as well but to start off the usgs uh, hvo volcano watch last week was describing how west flank seismicity had been, had increased as you can see over here in this upper graph um, corresponding to this first ever um, i'll call it a passive magmatic change uh, measured on tilt here and that corresponded to this contractional distance across this MLK MLSP line as well right this is just zoomed in here from January to May and similar to what we're looking at before right so we, we we're looking at what this might mean especially this contractional event and of course this line in particular the MLK the MOKP to MLSP being an interesting one because we've noted that in past research here's Decker from 1983 that line would be from here to here, right, line six in this diagram. Notice we also have a line three and a line two that go across here. So in 1983, prior to 84, they actually saw on lines two and three a fairly steady signal here. But line six started showing this contraction as well. And so that's the interesting signal there that happens to be perhaps localized to that MOKP to MLSP line, the one that, we're, that we, we have available on the website today, right? And the reason that's important is because uh, if you try to model where the zone of inflation is coming from, um, if we look at this zone A with this little center of pressure as it was in 1983, it says present from his 83 publication, but this projects upward to the south of the main caldera, which is right in there. So it actually can push the caldera to contract in certain directions, although the overall pattern is that of, of uh, inflation on a, on a broader term, right? So, uh, and here are the earthquakes we see in the northwest, here are the ones we see above, and you can't really see in and out of the page there where the upper southwest rift zones, the earthquakes would be similar to these ones above this zone of 
magma reservoir. So, right, so um, we'll see proposed here that this is not necessarily, I mean, we've been discussing it as a shallow chamber, perhaps, and it might be more like a sill, like a blade like flat pattern. Because it appears that the center of pressure does migrate from here to over here to over here, so it wanders around a bit. And if that, if it were just a, a spherical magma chamber, you wouldn't expect that as much. And so there's some speculation that maybe you have something that's more, more in this direction here, and whereas down here you have things that are more in this direction. And your dike complex coming in through here, and then it gets to some point shallow, and the shallowest part of it is a little flatter, so it can migrate around. That's the idea here that we'll, we'll bring forward. And then, of course, uh, Decker follows up in 2008, and so you can see here MLKP as one uh, one anchor point, MLSP as being one line, or HV92 being the second one, and HV92 being this light blue upper plot here that maybe shows a little bit of wiggle right in here, but it's not nearly as sensitive to that contractional signal signal as we see it down here on that uh, straight north-south station, right? And that mattered because you can see this red line in the case 1984 eruption. And so we'd like to know what are what is different and what is similar to what happened before 84 to what's happening now, because if this is possibly a lead up to some more drastic change that leads to an eruption, we'd like to to at least be talking about it ahead of time, even if we really won't know until something actually changes. Right, you know, we're looking at the possibilities of what's happening here. And of course, that was one one um, event. You can see there are other events where you see contraction, you don't have eruptions happening afterwards, right? Uh, of course, there are other factors as well, and I don't want to get too lost in the weeds there, but um, that's, that's how it was in 2008. And so we've actually brought it forward um, to, to present. This is after publication, um, uh, by Thalen and all 2017, I've just come in here and I've added on the end part of the graph here on the right uh, to try to bring it forward from when it was published in 2017. So our current GPS line, our little contraction is right down in here, right in that little spot right up there. I'm going to kind of draw, I didn't draw the last couple of weeks here, but it fits right, right like that. And you, what I want to point out is that in 2015, we had a lot of earthquakes as well. Here's earthquakes on the bottom, and we had this little bulge with a contraction afterwards that happened on the GPS and we did not have an eruption that followed afterwards, right? So that's our, that's our two end member cases here. Do we have something like this happening where we have a lot of earthquakes, contraction again, and we're just not going to erupt because a pattern of earthquakes now is actually more similar to 2015 era than it seems to be to some of the previous eras, right? And of course, the previous eras, there's a whole, the whole paradigm of summit event being followed by a flank event as a paired sequence that are connected in time right? and that's not exactly what we're seeing here we're seeing a slightly different pattern of of uh deformation here right so that's all kind of last week and of all that supported of course by the most recent insert released by the usgs which is showing this broader area of deformation around the whole upper summit and a little bit more down here in this upper southwest rift zone, right? You can see that we're actually coming into this upper southwest rift zone area. We really don't go into the northeast rift zone area hardly at all, right? So we're really going more to the south, um, this go around. Whereas you're, if, if you know about Mauna Loa's historical eruptions, the 80s, 84 eruption, the most recent one, went off in this direction. So um, it was, it's been expected for some time that as these things um, not always, but very often alternate that you would expect the next eruption to switch from the northeast in 84 to the southwest rift. Um, still expecting a summit sequence first, then followed by some flank in the southwest rift at some point in the future, right? That's our paradigm as it exists right now. And of course, we're just humans trying to understand nature, and of course, we don't understand nature that well. We're just trying to approximate what we know. So. Surprises may well be in store for us there. It's just what we, how we think of it, the best, best idea now. And interestingly, that NSR did show shallow deformation due to earthquakes on March 6th here, and that's the area above that shallow part of that sill, shallow chamber, magma reservoir, however you think of it or call it. I mean, so let's just sit in the background here. So let's turn to new publication here by Varugo and Amalong um, earlier this week. And what they're doing is similar. They're looking at the INSAR as well and a GPS. And so they've actually derived from INSAR. Let's look at this. Let me zoom in here to the top right. 
And here's the data we're using, the INSAR, which is showing, showing their measurement um, line of sight deformation, right? So actually going back to this upper plot is going from 2010 to 2020, 10 years here. And east flank GPS stations, west flank GPS stations, and our two summit GPS stations right in here. Right? They've also broken it down here below by earthquakes around the summit, earthquakes on an eastern flank, earthquakes on a western flank here. Right? And we just sh we just sh showed you guys from the from the volcano watch article that our western flank that it was it was low through here, but then we actually have some spikes over here on the right end of this western. So that's this is the 2020 version, 2021 addition to what was what was out in 2020 here. Right? And we go through May 2020 in case you're curious about that. So um, shifting patterns here, you can see really not a whole lot of, not a whole lot in the west, and that's what's really been been more different, right? You see that you saw that more in 2014 and 15. More activity in this western decolment, but I also see it more now in 2021. That's that's the volcano watch piece that's not on here, right? And likewise, we've had continuing summit and east rift zone. I'm sorry, eastern Tacoma, not east rift zone. We're talking about Mount Loa here, not Kilauea. The eastern flank um, that that moves um, with Kil which Kilauea is part of, in fact, there. So here they have GPS uh, arrows and. Back to 2010, the 2010 to 2014 is in black, 2014 to 15 is in red, 15 to 18 is in blue, and 18 to 20 again in red. So you see essentially a radial pattern from the center going outwards right, from all in all directions, all sides. And if you were to add all these lengths, you can you can see that there is longer lines here on a right on the eastern side, on the eastern flank. So really, the eastern flank is much more mobile for Mauna Loa. Um, it's been moving um, and accommod accommodating much of the volume by flank movement, in fact, is one of the big big conclusions here, right? So um, they're able to go back and taking this INSAR data back from 2002 all the way to 2020 here. And the result is that, that, is that uh, just in the past six years here, and maybe I'll... Maybe I'll jump forward here to this. Is this the next one here? No, let's go to. Yeah, no, okay. We'll just do an order. Just in the last six years, we've had an order of um, 0.11 cubic kilometers of new magma coming into the dike. And that might might just be an abstract number. Okay, 0.11, what's that really? That's that's so far in the last six years, that's half the volume of what erupted in 1984 is coming in the last six years underground, filling that that area uh, within the volcano. Um, they are are suggesting, and I think I will jump forward here, and I'll jump forward to this this graph here, and I will skip some of this stuff here. But um, they have here this particular plot is a plot of the movement of that southeast flank of Mauna Loa as extracted from their INSAR. So you can see that it's been moving a long a long way since 2002 to 2020. We've actually had four meters of slip, right? They're talking about an order of 15 feet or so of slip on the eastern flank moving out of the way of magma coming in behind it, right? And as a consequence, they're saying that that dike, that big tabular sheet-like body underneath Mauna Loa, it has also expanded. And it's expanded by, by yeah, similarly, you know, over four meters, um, 15 feet or so expansion of that tabular body. So, uh, but what's interesting is that there's a period here, and so now, now I'm going to scroll to the left and look at this other plot. They've also derived from their models, and I'm jumping ahead here, but I'll get to the, how the models are done here. They've, they've derived how much magma is coming in over time as well. So this is cumulative magma in million cubic meters here on the left. So 2002, 2006, it's coming in at this with a, with a, a fairly steep slope here so it's coming in fairly rapidly this is that last pulse of magma coming in that came into uh Kiloa and Mauna Loa both we've talked about in the past and then it slows down a little bit and in fact between 2010 and 2014 it seems like it stops right there's essentially no measured magma influx coming in during that time and since then you can see 2014 to 15 it comes in faster slows down a little bit speeds up a little bit and that's the pattern we've seen here within the last uh, last six years, right? It's essentially all, it was one of increasing. We're still in the middle of this. We haven't come to the flattening off spot. Magma is still coming into the volcano right here. 
So we're still building, 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 right? And you can see that since 2002, you know, we're, we've we've come up to oh, 200 million cubic meters already there, right? That's a huge amount, right? Um, so um, this is an example of a volcano filling with magma without needing to erupt. And that's a pattern we saw in 2015, which is apparently is still ongoing today, given this, right? But focus on this era, in this era between 2010 and 14, right in here, right? When we have no magma influx, if we go to the south flank of Mauna Loa plot, you can see that the south flank is actually moving quite a lot. So really, during these four years of flank movement is what precedes this influx of magma here. Right? So you have a batch of magma come in, it stops, the flank moves in response, then a batch of magma comes in response to the flank moving one more time, right in there. And that is what's happening ongoing now. So when we're talking about these cycles of flank movement and magma coming in, we're seeing that in the most recent data here as well. Um, so okay, let me so let me step back here and talk about a GPS, and let me talk about the GPS in a little more detail as far as these eras, right? So four eras of GPS shown here. This bottom one, 2010 to 2014. This is that era of calm, right? When magma is not coming in. So more closely here, you can see on the west side, not a whole lot of motion. And there's two sets of arrows here. There's their modeled arrows and then the actual observed arrows. And that's why there's red and blue arrows both. And in theory, they should be fairly close to matching. Um, and we'll just assume that they are without without questioning the model um, extensively here. But what you can see is that this, this west side, very small magnitudes of arrows. And on the east side, you can see this is that flank movement, right? This whole southeast flank moving. And they've drawn on here uh, what they imagine might be a slip area of this fault, right? Which is moving without earthquakes, moving aseismically. But we're seeing movement on GPS. We're seeing movement um, uh, through the INSAR as well, right? But uh, they're saying that, that for this period, the slip rate was 33 centimeters per year, right? For four years. So you're talking about, a, we got over a meter there. And that corresponds to, if you were to add it all up, if it had all moved at once over that same area, that would be the equivalent of magnitude 6.0 earthquake. Now, it's not, it wasn't an earthquake. We're talking about things that don't exactly compare. We're talking about the energy release being somewhat equivalent there, right? So if we're saying, well, we really need to have these magnitude 6 earthquakes on the flanks to have to, to really be able to move the, the, the volcanic edifice to induce eruptions, well, we are having processes happen now, and even since 2010, since 2002 even, that are doing that. They're accomplishing that much motion, um, but they're not leading to eruptions, perhaps because the flank is moving out of the way, the, the dike is filling passively without having to erupt, and it just keeps moving out of the way and filling passively over and over and over, right? And the question is, when will it stick and be forced, forced to the surface in, in whatever way, right? And it maybe not just stick, but we also have this west flank. It's interesting, this west flank also is ability to move. And if it doesn't move and it stays stuck, this might be the one that gives. And if it gives, then it's much more likely that we follow with a upper southwest zone eruption um, in sequence after that. Right. So, But nowhere near that yet. So we're talking about 2010 and 14 still. No, no movement in the west flank. The southeast flank is moving right through there. Equivalent to magnitude 6, 33 centimeters per year, um, 5 by 10 kilometer area right there, that fault zone that would have to move. So now we'll advance to 2014 to 15, and you can see massive, large arrows here on this plot because this is an era of injection of the, 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 the largest uh, rate of magma into Mauna Loa um, uh, recently here. Right? So, um, as a reason, so they're modeling this as this. this uh, let me change my color so you guys can see something besides this red. But we have this point source, which is the approximation for that sill or upper reservoir or upper magma chamber or however you think of it. And we have this longer line here, which is approximation of the dike that's being filled from underground, right? And it's being filled from below, and that's pushing everything away from that in every direction here. So that's true in 2014 and 15, and quite fast. 2015 and 18, 2018, you still see a similar pattern, but reduced in amplitude. 
And from 2018 to 2020, it's picked back up again. And you can see that it's actually resuming that big arrow pattern um, through here as well. So um, let me see here if I can get, get some rates for you guys for some, some of these eras here. And we had 33 centimeters per year for 2010 to 14 dropped to 21 during this era 22 for this era and now up to 23 and so even during these low low quote unquote movements of the south flank of Mauna Loa we're still really trucking it along at at uh, over 20 centimeters a year so average of 23 centimeters a year for that that era right and that's what corresponds to over 18 years four meters of movement added all together there across all all those eras and so they actually get this by by having that model a finite element model um they're calculating all kinds of things including stresses but they're also matching the the um, instar they're detecting here so upper row here this is all the uh, uh, observations and this is the models that are matched to them and so same thing data and model and they're matching that as well. It's, it's the same same authors as we've um, at least one of the same authors, same research group from University of Miami that does this stress modeling and Mauna Loa um, sequence of, of research here. Okay, and so um, they also have calculated how much magma equivalent uh, would come in from these from from this deformation pattern, right? And so they're not calling it eruption rate; they're calling it potency rate over here. Right. And so you can see that that era of 2014 to 15, we're in a range of 28 million cubic meters in that year. And um, down over here um, for 2015 and 18, and then up slightly over here. Right. So um, this is around 11, 12, and this is around 17 or so. Right. That's about how much is coming in. So the post was really here, and you see where that we've been trending upwards, but we're not at the rates really of magma build up as we were in 2014 and 15. And so you can see that if we survive 2014 and 15 without erupting, that we're not quite to that point that yet here, maybe we'll get there. We can talk about that as an analog, but we don't seem to be quite there as far as the, uh, how much magma is coming in. And of course, we're not to 2021. 2021 may change the equation here. And of course, it takes time to, to prepare and present this, right? So, all right. So let me come to back to here and let's go to this upper diagram and discuss what their model actually looks like in cross-section, right? So we're looking at, this is to the, to the south, to the left, north, to the right. And this is a summit of Mauna Loa right here, summit of Caldera. Zero is sea level, and depth below sea level, distance across, back and forth there. So that 2014 and 15 model is showing um, a very tall, right? Something like a, a eight and a half kilometer tall, five mile tall blade of magma right? that had to come in at 28 million cubic meters a year. And it came into place. And it's interesting that in 2014 and 15, the magma did not force a rise to the surface. It rather hit a ceiling, so to speak, a cap right here, right? which these author authors are labeling here as a topographic stress, essentially the weight of the mountain, these blue arrows are pushing down and we don't have enough pressure to exceed that cap, that weight cap of the mountain to actually erupt up and out. But there is weakness along the rift zone. So rather the magma does have enough pressure, did have enough pressure to push to the south, propagating through two different swarms of earthquakes here. Um, in February and August 2015 here, shown by these black dots is where the earthquakes actually were. Right? So eventually, by the next frame, we're going to have a magma body that's all the way to here in the west. Right? But essentially what's happening is all this lower part of the magma body is still rising, rising, rising. It's this cap, and it wants to spread laterally. Right? But it's not spreading to the north. It's actually coming up, and it's spreading to the south. And that's the pattern here, 2014 and 15, right? And what they see is the inflation source that had been tracked to be farther over now starts working its way back towards the center. So that's indicating something like magma is not 
moving in there anymore and it's actually likely freezing in that upper southwest rift area and the, the, the formation center moves back towards the caldera this is during that drop in rate right so if we have a drop in rate then maybe we're not feeding in enough hot magma to actually feed this hot end of the dike and keep it fluid so we keep this other part fluid but we can't keep the very very far fingertip right that's where our, our frostbitten fingertip comes in right there at the end and so that's 2015 to 18 and the most recent increment subphase of this of this uh six years of of intrusion here uh jumping up 50 percent or so to 17 million cubic meters per year and you can see that uh if anything we've migrated slightly closer to the caldera once again right but we really have more or less the same shape there we're just essentially moving moving it back over but magma is coming in it's coming a little faster and so maybe now it's pushing a little bit more under the caldera we still haven't really breached the northeast rift zone yet right and that's the big the big term pattern here so that's the overall picture there um Mag for the last six years, magma, magma has been coming in, and you can see that it was coming in quickly in the first couple years, slow down, and it's starting to increase again, although we're not anywhere near uh, the 28 here. We're still at 17 for the last two years uh, through May of 2020, right? And once again, down here in the bottom left, this is magma coming in, so the 2002 intrusion stabilizing and then our ongoing 6 year 2014 to 2020 and on intrusion ongoing right now as well and importantly south flank is still moving right you can see that this is happening this was started happening before any of the Kilauea lower east Rift zone activity in 2018 right? that could be part of it and affecting it as well at some point in time right but back to 2010 we're seeing the south flank motion on Mount Loa, which maybe, you know, it works both ways. Maybe Mount Loa pushing Kilauea um, also allowed it to pressurize in that 2010 to 2018 era, right? So. We have a $30 super chat from Gary Bryan, who says, love the technical breakdown of measurements and observations. Awesome preparation, guys. Thank you, Gary, as always. Appreciate it. Mahalo, Gary. Mahalo. So yeah, I mean, those are really the, the the main diagrams here. I do have you know more. There's a lot of information that they've put out, and I'll try to recap some of it here while I let me just leave this one up here for you guys to to look at and ask, ask questions of. We did mention that they modeled this as both a dike and a and some complication up above it, right? That point source they often call it a point emoji source, um, but some point source that corresponds to something shallower, maybe a shallow reservoir, shallow magma chamber has been used before, but maybe it's not exactly a magma chamber, but some blade, some extension, some complexity of this longer blade here, right? And so uh, the modeling suggests that about two thirds, yeah, not quite two thirds, 60% of the arriving magma for the last six years came into this, into this zone right through here, right? Into this, into this blade right through there. So what that what that does mean though is that almost forty percent of the magma made it to that shallower portion in the last six years. Forty percent of it. That's that's a huge amount. That's consistent with, 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 uh, with what we hear the USGS talking about now, as far as a shallow system starting to show signals. Maybe maybe that's what the tilt's showing us is that shallow system being being full and showing deformation as well. Right. So that's interesting as well that we we are seeing seeing that. So the volcano is filling, filling, filling. And the bottom line is we haven't been able to break this cap above it, right? But if magma keeps coming in at these high rates that it's showing now and, and doesn't come back to something flatlining as far as magma coming in, then there's no other way except for it to erupt at some point, right? At some point, it's going to be able to overcome that, that barrier, right? It might push farther to the sides over and over again before that happens. But at some point, it will pop through that cap. And that's the, the eruption coming up, right? And that's what, that would be just from magma coming into the volcano. And add on to that, if we were to have an earthquake, especially in a west flank of Mauna Loa, then that unclamps everything and it allows all this magma that's in here to all move up. And then it's just a ticking, a ticking um, clock, right? As far as when it's going to come up to the surface, if we see a big, big earthquake. Um, 
as it is, even though there have been there's been so much movement of the uh, east flank, um, it's not possible to exclude that there could be a big earthquake on the east flank still in the Kauriki area or in the Hilea areas. That'd be surprising because we have seen repeatedly, you know, these uh, uh, injections that correspond to to uh, uh, earthquake equivalents of magnitude sixes or so, right? So um, that east flank is has been active. It's the southwest flank that's getting just as much pressure. That when a when a dike is it's filling and it's pushing to both sides, it's push, pushing to the east and the west. At west, the same. The east is moving, but the west is not. So the West is stuck, right? And that's good that it, the East can move them out, of, out of its way. But if for some, re some reason the West comes unstuck at any point, then that's, that's a big adjustment for the volcano to go through, um, and likely it has an eruption because of that. And that's, that's uh, one aspect of that, because that Southwest uh, flank hasn't really moved significantly since 2002, according to the, the authors here. Right, so that's, that's one, one aspect of it as far as what might come next. Um, from the eruption here. Um, what else do I want to make sure that I include for you guys here? Um, this upper cap here, that's about two and a half kilometers down below the surface, right? So that's, that's supposed to be the upper boundary. So all the earthquakes we're seeing are all above that area. All the colored earthquakes are all above that. That's why, if when you look at this diagram, not a surprise to see them under the main caldera and under the upper southwest rift zone. That's area exactly in our cross section right in here. Okay, so um, altogether in the last six years, the magma, we think that this thing, rather than injecting new dikes, has just been filling this one and fattening it. And so it's gotten two and a half meters fatter uh, in the last six years. You know, that's that's talking in an order of, or what is that? Maybe it's nine feet, 10 feet, somewhere, you know, some eight, eight to 10 feet, somewhere there. Um, so it's really, rather than injecting more dikes with more earthquakes, it's going to the the pathway is still open. It's just fattening that thing as the south flank's moving out of the way. It's filling it passively through there as well, right? And this is not unlike what we saw on Kilauea, for example, following a 1975 earthquake and passive, you know, like very fast filling of the rift zone areas you know, from increased magma supply um, that followed south flank movement. And in the case of Kilauea, um, the magma was, was, was likely the cause there, pushing everything out of the way and eventually culminating in an 83 eruption of Pu'o'o that went on 35 years. And that connects to a lot of the other history that we've talked about as well. So um, interesting to, to, to see that. Um, um, okay, there is, I forgot to, forgot to put in one of my diagrams here. So let me grab it and throw it in here real quick for you guys. Um, because I want to show you guys the uh, migration of that inflation center. Um, the um, here it is. All right. So the drawn-in periods here: twenty fourteen and fifteen is in red, fifteen and eighteen is in green, and eighteen to twenty is in blue. And you can see they've they've pinpointed here if it was you know for the point source model where is that point source inflating and that big injection um, was inflating over here and you can see that for 2015 and 18 it shifted south significantly and for the more more recent period of two years it shifted back to the north right and that's why and that's why we see that pattern of that that blade you know moving to the south and then retreating freezing its way back over closer to the caldera right in there right and so very interesting. This is exactly the same spot that we saw in the uh, diagrams um, by Decker, 1983, as far as the shallow inflation source of Mauna Loa before that eruption. It's also right in here, and so we can see that the shallow system is active, and that's maybe the the, the um, one of the important pieces of information that we don't we make sure we don't ignore is that we are inflating that shallow system. We are seeing tilt, and so we are to the point where we're possibly getting close to where we could break that upper cap or push the flank out to the side. And that's why that contractional piece is really so, so interesting is that contraction north to south, as we saw here, lead, you know, um, going to lead to an 84 situation. 
with an eruption, or is it going to lead to a 2015 a situation where we don't actually erupt and just keep moving the flank? Right? So the uh, the recency of 2015 would lend you to might suggest that that's what's going to happen again now. But some of the patterns are interesting that that we didn't have in as much detail in 1984 or 75, and we're just trying to untangle some of these threads here. Right. So one more time here, the summary figure. Um, showing an inflation Mauna Loa, and remember once again that western part picking up over here to the side, right? So the western flank is moving a little more more recently here, right? That's what our USGS deformation is showing us here. The western flank is a little more mobile, and that allowed that shallow summit source to to show a tilt deflation, a localized tilt deflation, and our MLKP to MLSP line has been contracting as well, right? And of course, that may or may not be the same as what's happening elsewhere across. Uh, it might be localized. And so back to the uh, same working group, um, 2005 paper, this earthquake volcano interaction cycle here. Um, we are just bouncing through this thing over and over and over again, right? So you might get to the, you might say, okay, well, we've actually had so besides just earthquakes, you might say, okay, the flank movement might might qualify as an adjustment, right? That will reduce the stresses on the sides of the volcano. So earthquakes slash flank movement happening here, right? That's allowing unclamping of the rift zone and decompression of the magma. And that may be where we are at this point right in here. We're waiting to see, are we going to have more magma inject because of this, right? Because of this adjustment of the flank? And if so, will it add more pressure? And will that pressure lead to a renewed eruption? Or have we got to the point where that flank decrease right there is allowed in, uh, enough unclamping that the decompression is not going to be followed? We're going to be stuck in between here right, where we can actually relieve pressure and not bring in more stuff in, right? So um, that seems doubtful, honestly, because you see the, the long-term pattern of Mauna Loa changes. The, these, these changes don't happen. They don't happen on a dime, right? It's not like suddenly one day the magma stops coming in. It's a slow rise and a slow fall over months and years and things like that. So more than likely our magma keeps coming in and we're just going to wait to see whether we see a big earthquake in a flank, whether we see continued flank movement, or whether we start seeing some of this triggering that might lead to an eruption at the summit here. And no imminent signals of that yet. Right? We're trying to put it in a context in a big picture, 18 year, 20 year picture here, right? A big and a big picture for the last 20 years, we're closer than ever to this eruption, but we're not seeing the shortest term signals yet, right? And you know, of course, they are complicated um, and messy based on the, on the past eruptions here. So uh, I will uh, stop that there. You know, um, we do want to make sure we say our thank yous. You know, we are brought by Hawaii Tracker, um, and there is one additional thank you we're going to announce this week, um, which is that. This program today is brought to you in part by a grant by the Hawaii Island Strong Fund of the Hawaii Community, Community Foundation in partnership with the County of Hawaii. It's being supported by the, that's, that's a, also known as a Puna Strong Grant, um, Hawaii County, um, Hawaii Community Foundation. Mahalo everyone for your support here. So Dane, um, turn to you to take us through some more of our thank yous. Well, uh, yeah, we appreciate uh, that grant really helps out. Uh, we had the super chat from Gary Bryan, want to acknowledge that again. And we also had a new donator on hawaiitracker.com, uh, Pat G. I yeah, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, let's get into some questions. You know, if you like this type of content, make sure to like, subscribe, ring that notification bell. That'll help you get the notifications when we go live or when we post a video following a live or anything along those lines, uh, check out hawaiitracker.com. It's where we post our content uh, in chronological order, give you a one-stop shop to go and find out the latest on the volcanoes. And yeah, if you feel like making a donation, we do take those on hawaiitracker.com slash support. So with that, let's get into some questions. We got some interesting ones here. Um, so Richard asks, does Mauna Loa Caldera collapse and refill like Kilauea, or does it stay similar to it, what it is now? 
uh, yes, it does collapse and refill. Absolutely, it's it's uh it's it's full enough now that you don't really see much of the collapse structure. Right? But when we when we looked at some of the uh, our previous um, somewhat caught era diagrams, you know, when a, when a Wilkes party arrived in 1841, they did see a deeper inner pit and several shelves that have all been buried by lava in, in the time since. So absolutely yes. Um, we'll get into that uh, at some point in the next week or two uh, as far as caldera collapses, timing of that. Um, the questions of explosions as well are something we're going to cover um, in, a, in a short near future as well. And um, tied to that, interestingly enough, is the whole idea of permafrost on our mountains and glaciations and all of that. So we're gonna, you know, that's going to be a, a whole thread untangle in the future here coming up. Um, but bottom line, yes, we do have big calderas. They do collapse. They do have we do have um, not as big explosions. There are some explosions there as well, and lava does come in and refill them. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one question myself um, about the diagrams that we we're looking at. The lava cap at roughly sea level going down to what two kilometers mm -hmm. is that an other word for a shallow magma chamber, or is that like leftover magma from the last eruption? How do you envision that cap? Like, it's it's the it's the layers of lava flows, just you know layers and layers and layers of surface flows, most of them that are making up the the structure, like the bulk of the volcano. Right? Most of it is just the the rock that came out and cooled. And it's built up over the, you know, over the th you know, thousands and thousands of years, just you know, as it kind of came out of the ocean and layered itself up and up and up and up and up and up. And so what used to be at the surface of the volcano now sits two and a half kilometers right. down. So that's and, just the, the old flows from back then creating, right. creating that cap and the voids between them and stuff along those lines. Yeah, that's the bulk of it. And then the, the, cra the cracks and the voids between them is where the magma would want to go. And that's that's right. where the, the – the, and overall, when we talk about these magma bodies, or, you know, these you know, – they, they can be quite tall and quite long, you know, um, but they end up being not very thick, right? You know, in the order of talking about, you know, this is a big movement for this, for this blade of magma. 15 feet is a lot. But 15 feet doesn't compare to, um, you know, um, eight miles in one direction and three miles in the other direction. That's just a whole different scale. Like, you know, they're much, much right. taller and wider than they are thick. Right. So as far as mm -hmm. like, you don't need to have that big a crack and it doesn't take, take up that much of the space. It's one little blade through a massive, massive pancake of stacks of cold lava flows. Right. I sent you a photo for this one. And pull that up maybe uh richard williams on youtube asks is there a scenario where mauna loa could erupt and cover kilauea uh the yes I, the photo i sent you kind of shows a little bit of that yeah okay so um this is a, looks like a map from google earth that's got uh superimposed the mauna loa lava flow layers and a uh, lines as deep as the sand here Yep. So what you can see here is a, a, a flow that came off of Mauna Loa's northeast rift zone right in here and flowed south. And in this case, it actually came up against this ridge on the edge of Kilauea and turned to the south and went um, along the boundary of Kilauea that way. Right? So you can imagine a bigger flow could just overtop that and then come fill in this hole right in here. There's no reason why not. Why well, that couldn't happen, really. It is, there are downhill paths all the way to get there. Um, and there is a pattern of, um, there's kind of a cycle, right? If you look at the early 1800s fishers, well, I'm sorry, early, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s fishers, they, they begin farther north and they migrate their way slightly to the south, slightly to the south, slightly to the south. And that matters because uh, when a flow is more to the south and it starts spilling its volume more to the south, and you might not have any flow to the north, and the, that it matters whether your flow is split both north and south, or whether you have all the volume going one way. And so, the reason I bring this up is if the if you had a fissure that was on the south side of that ridge and you took most of the flow, then you'd be more likely to have a flow that could come in and and come into Kilauea, right? right. Um, it wouldn't cover everything, of course. I mean, it's just gonna gonna overlap it, and that's often what you see happening. Not not just here, but if we were to look further over, you know, in this area to the east, 
like down in HPP area, there are there are pockets of Mauna Loa Kipuka surrounded by Kilauea lava flows, or they are inter interlayering. There are lots of uh, several areas like that as well. You can also get that uh, where it puts down the first lobe of the eruption it runs down, say, to Highway 11 area, and mm -hmm. it stops, and then it resets, goes a little bit further down the rift. Now you have a barrier that's going to basically push it towards the caldera, mm -hmm. um, just acting as a guide. Yeah, so there's some weird scenarios that can get it in there for sure, and not even be a you know mind blowing eruption. It could just be Mauna Loa doing Mauna Loa things. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's go to the next one. It's interesting right. because you know geologically, you know, if it's happened, if if you can see the possibility of it happening now, it's it's likely that it's happened at least once in the past. We just don't don't have the evidence right. to, to see it, right? But you can imagine that that must have must have happened at some point in the past, and will happen at some point in the future. Whether people are around, that's a whole other perhaps philosophical question. Right. So Mary asked a question that we get every once in a while. Um, watching a program on TV about Hawaii that suggested eventually someday the whole southern flank of the island could break off and collapse, causing a devastating mega tsunami landslide. Uh, is that a real possibility? Or is that a small small level of a landslide collapse or uh, or possible shifts? We've seen these, you know, the, the if we're talking the, the catastrophic scenarios on YouTube, there's two big ones for landslides on Hawaii. One involves Kilauea's south flank, and the other one was the western flank of Mauna Loa that I've seen, you know, YouTube videos of. But they are, so yeah, what are your thoughts on those? So normally they get it wrong and they talk about the southern flank of Kilauea as being the, the one that's the the more imposing one right because there is this famous on youtube at least healing slump area down over here south of kilauea right but it's likely that that was that was a, a collapse when kilauea was in a much much younger stage still underwater and and steeper size it's a whole different game than what's, than what's happening now right it's, it's almost a prehistoric thing and you also have Loihi over here, and you have other complexities, you know, on the C4, right? So that doesn't seem like it's the um, the place where like where that, that could happen. Right? However, on its west side here, southwest of Mauna Loa, these like this big scallop right in there, right? These are landslide scars, and you do see landslide deposit blocks farther offshore over here. So that's that's an area that I'd be more concerned about, um, and it's not. You know, if you if you if you do that, then you essentially you you can't take as easily and say, oh, this big chunk of land over here is all going to slit off at one time, and the shoreline's going to be all through here, which is often how these models assume that they're gonna, all this has room to all fall into what's in truth already filled with rock and support down there, right? But um, if we were to take that chunk of the island off, then you can generate those kind of mega tsunami scenarios. Um, you can get pretty big pretty big ones by dropping off chunks of this shelf over here as well um, um it seems that that kind of thing is more likely when you have the volcano swelling and really pushing the west flank really fast that way if that were to happen then you might be more concerned about landslides over here but since the west flank is barely moving at all now i'm currently not that concerned with that that as it is right there right and if it were to give them some big magnitude six earthquake then you might be more worried that 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 could give um, but there's no indication of anything loose there right now or moving at this point in time. And it might correspond to, in fact, a persistent era of west flank movement, right? Like, like, like the southeast flank is moving now. If that were happening on the west flank continuously over and over and over, over millennia, that's when you might imagine this era of land, landslides being more likely to occur because you're adjusting this flank all the time over and over and over again. Right now, it's sitting there more stable, right? You know, there was a, an earthquake preceding the 1950 eruption in this area. Um, and that would be what we what we might expect as you know, one-off adjustment that might lead to opening in the southwest, upper southwest rift zone if it, if it occurs in that area right over there. right? And it seems like if there is going to be a big earthquake, that seems a most likely place now, given that we've seen how much this east flank has been moving. right? Why would you have another earthquake there when you can just keep moving the thing without earthquakes? That wouldn't make much sense. It's possible you might still have there are areas that might catch, and you know we don't really know everything, of course. So you know there's still even a door open for magnitude six here or here, but really it's the one on this side that you worry about. 
um, for what's coming up next in a volcano. And since it's stuck, really, I wouldn't worry about landslides anytime soon here. But there, there is a history of that kind of thing happening, right? And um, maybe I'll just take, take a quick second here to, to just to mention, you know, it's interesting to talk about all the things that can happen. Um, but that's not the only important aspect to consider here. It's not just that they can happen, but how often do they happen? What's the rate at which they happen? How common are they? And so, do we, and that's where we should then lead to whether we whether we worry about it or not. So, even though, for example, these these uh, landslides in the southwest flank can happen, they happen so infrequently, we probably shouldn't be worrying about them. And more so on the south flank. I mean, just like a meteorite could come and hit the Earth, or the ocean, anywhere in the Pacific at any point in time. That's always a chance that could cause a tsunami, but it's so infrequent we don't worry about that really day to day either. Right? But that's a possibility. It's a possibility the sun could fry us all, but most people don't worry about that every day either. Right? But there, it's all about the rate at which these things happen. Not that they can happen, but how often will they happen? Right? So that can really guide us to what we worry about more and what's more frequently happening rather than the sexiest, biggest, most dramatic collapse or eruption or explosion or event that can actually be. And so that's my, my little PSA there, you know, about this. Right. What really, tri you know, um, triggers a debate about the healing a slump and um, big collapses of the island. They do happen, but we probably shouldn't worry about them. That's my bottom line. All right. JW has an interesting question. He asks about uh, SO2 is so envisioning the so2 in the lava in depth is it um effervescently like bubbles coming through the surface the so2 or does the heat and pressure dissolve it into the magma like conceptually speaking how should uh, people think about that it's dissolved it's dissolved uh until it's coming out of the ground essentially right so um, when it's when it's rising to the surface that's when SO2 is coming out of solution in the bubbles, and that's when it's coming to erupt. So SO2 usually means magma is coming to the surface during or about to erupt. So there is no SO2 being measured right now in Mauna Loa. And it's all in the magma still dissolved. It hasn't bubbled up yet. right? Unlike the CO2, which we believe came out much earlier, much further, further down in the, 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 condo, the plumbing system, if you will. Um, let's call this the last question for the day. CK asks, um, I'll just read this one out. Just before the Kilauea eruption, 2018, there was a, actually, I'm not sure what he's referencing. Just before the Kilauea eruption, there was a pattern on Mauna Loa that repeated recently, roughly. Since Kilauea eruption seems to be winding down, what might be the effect this time? I'm not sure which pattern they're referring to, though. On yeah, I'm not I'm not quite sure either. Here's our GPS plots. The first one I would look look at, and our Kilauea eruption falls right in here, and so it actually proceeds, you know, back to January 2018 to about September 2018. That area was pretty flat, right? And that was when we're starting to see pressure at Kilauea summit um, and build up towards overflows of the lava lake that was happening early in 2018 already, right there. And it was after that. So really, you know, before that, we were rising kind of slowly. And you can see that since then, we were rising more fast, more quickly. And uh, I do personally believe that is likely because Kilauea stopped erupting. You know, we've discussed a little bit this connection through the pore pressure. Um, so, you know, um, it's, you know, we... we when talking about those poor pressure connect connections, there's really not a whole lot known. Once again, it comes back to the modeling and how we imagine it, it to be modeled. They're imagining something like a six-month lag between something in Kilauea and something in Mauna Loa occurring. So I suppose it is possible, you know, that coming up, right, leading up to the uh, eruption of Kilauea in December 2020, we had an intrusion that was the very, very end of November, right, right around the beginning of December, right? So... You think about that first event, and we're pressurized to intrude. Six months from then is about now. So it could be that there is, because Kilauea is pulling more of the, the, the juice, so to speak, more of the pressure that Mauna Loa might, might uh, 
decrease in response. That's a theory, right? And I don't know that I could say that we see that. That's just a theory that we're interested in to see, it, see if that, that is what is observed or not. That's one possibility. Or it just could be the point where it's got, gotten to the point where it's, it's adjusting more and more and more. And the next thing we get is a big earthquake. And that, that, that's the giveaway. So I really don't have the answer to the resolution of the, of the, of the question I put up at the beginning of our presentation here. You know, is it more like 2015 uh, or more like 84? I really just, we really don't know. We'll have to wait and see. It could be something that's neither, something in between, some combination of both. Really if there. That, we were talking about that cap getting breached. If that cap were to get breached and it were to go into an eruption sequence, what's the timeline then? Do you think, like ballpark timeline for it to, like for it to go in, for it to go into an eruption? From yeah, where we are now, runaway eruption sequence. We'll say the cap gets breached. We know that the cap gets breached due to some data or some interpretation, but we then know that it's been breached. Then it's coming right away. We, right, right away. When, it's yeah, happen quick. Yeah, we, we, when we see it get breached, it's coming up to the surface. It's like that's you know. Okay. So we we may you know it's it's not clear that we'll have you know. Um, extremely consistent long-term signals it might be this might be this kind of signal it's, it's adjusting and then stops and just more and then stops and just more and then it might go to a runaway crack to the summit as the first step right and then after that the, the clock starts for something happening on some rift zone some further adjustment from there but the fact that we're right. seeing magma moving to the sides and not reaching the cap that's that's interesting you know um and if we had a bigger pulse in 2014 and 15 and, and we couldn't breach the cap then um, can we do it again now? Um, we are seeing shallower signals now than we did in 2014 and 15. So maybe we're just, you know, the net, the net gain is enough, but that's really the, the to be determined aspect of what's coming next up Mauna Loa. All right. Well, that does it for me on this one. Um, we are going to be premiering another episode of Drones On covering May 9th and 10th of the 2018 kilowatt eruption. Get to talk about the Puna Geothermal Venture a little bit and some earthquake uh, signals signaling that magma was intruding further down the rift. So I hope you see you in there. It'll premiere immediately after the live stream. With that, I am out. Philip, thanks for the presentation. And mahalo, Dane. Mahalo, everyone who supported us. Mahalo to all our sponsors and all for all your great questions and discussion online. Oh, so thank you guys for your support. So for Hawaii Tracker, he is Dane DuPont. I am Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone.